Hi, I'm Allie Hamilton, and I'm so happy to welcome you to the Come As You Are podcast. Every week, we'll be talking about some aspect of healing, usually around childhood wounds and complicated familial relationships. The topics will always coincide with my personal essay of the week, and this will be a place where we can take a deep dive together. I'm so thrilled you've joined me and delighted for you to always come as you are. Hi there. Hi there. Welcome to our talk. This week, the topic is sense and sensibility. Uh, Sense spelled S-C-E-N-T-S. And the essay was really, I I dropped my son off uh, at college this weekend And for those of you who have been through that experience, you know it's a milestone. It's incredibly emotional. Obviously, not every situation is the same, but certainly there was a lot of emotion um, on my part and my son's part and my daughter's. You know, it's like, and I was writing uh, in the week prior about just how we had been like the three musketeers for so long I did the single mom thing for a long time and and so this weekend you know I drove six hours north of where we live and had the car packed to the brim and just did that whole sort of move in you know hack the tiny dorm room and make everything fit and make everything nice and yeah he's my first it's the first time one of my kids will not be living at home full time and it's definitely a lot of love and a lot of excitement and a lot of grief also and just acknowledging that it is it is a period of of mourning or grieving for what has passed you know the chapter where both kids are living in the house full time is behind us and it's not of course you know he'll be back he'll be back for every break and some you know all that stuff is coming I'll be going up there and we'll shift it's an evolution but certainly this time where you are transitioning just like any big transition in life brings up a lot of feeling and nostalgia and um and all of that. So I had a lot of anxiety the night before we left Been practicing yoga and teaching yoga 30 plus years and even the yogis, you know, there are things that happen in life where you're just, there's a lot, there's a lot of emotion. And so for me, I have had this kind of like ticker tape going in my brain for so long now with a checklist of all the things that he needs and all the things that have to you know the different dates and when forms need to be filled out and things need to be uploaded and just all of that you know what different things he's going to need for the dorm and and this is what you do right when you have kids you're constantly sort of anticipating what their needs are and trying to stay on top of everything and also at a certain point the job becomes really just to let them fly right to feel as much faith as you can that you've prepared them the best you can and that they're ready to leave the nest and one of the greatest things I think about the college experience is being in an unfamiliar place learning how to navigate living with other people in a small space learning how to communicate in a productive way being able to speak up if things are bothering you Um, all of that is I think at least equally (laughs) as valuable as the academic part which obviously is also like a huge it's just a beautiful in-between space where you're no longer living at home but you're not totally out in the world yet dealing with all of those responsibilities you have this this time where you get to well time right figure out how to manage your time and stay on top of things and make choices and sometimes 
this is how we learn. You go off on your own for the first time and maybe you don't manage your time that well or, you know, like you're procrastinating because there are so many fun things to do and then you learn the hard way, like staying up all night. Oh, that doesn't really work too well. So these are all like beautiful, wonderful things and I'm excited for my kid and he's definitely ready. Um, And also I was... There were times as I was driving home that I had to like really <laughs> wipe my eyes and you know so overcome so I could see the road in front of me and you know to it was hard to breathe like that's how intense it was for me to leave him and my daughter's also emotionally it's just a big transition for everybody when you have siblings that are really close and all of that so that's what my weekend just was and I'm actually recording this early I normally record the podcast on Fridays but um, it is Tuesday evening and I'm leaving very early tomorrow morning to go to New York to inter my mother's ashes my mom passed away at the end of 2021 very you know I won't pause too long and talk about it but it was obviously in the middle of the pandemic I did not write about this particular thing this week it's probably something I'll write about next week or soon Um, but my mother passed away during the pandemic and so we had a zoom memorial for her and she wanted to be cremated and I've spread her ashes in some places that I know would be incredibly meaningful for her she did not have a will that's something else we should talk about at some point but um we're gonna bury the urn with the rest of her ashes so I'm heading to New York in the morning so it's a lot of grieving for me right now and um loss and transition and I've been navigating that with my mother for the last few years but this does feel like a sort of significant last thing that we're now able to do and that we've been wanting to do so um, as much as anyone ever wants to do this kind of thing but also good for me to be in my hometown for a minute and I grew up in New York City I was born there so it's good for me to just like touch base Um, and see my stepdad which I like to do every six months my brother you know just to make sure everybody's okay I promised my mother I was gonna keep an eye on them and make sure they were okay and so it's good for me to get back regularly and just see with my own eyes like how things are going but it's a really intense time that I'm in in my life it's that sandwich generation thing that maybe you hear about but you don't really pay attention to till you're like eating the sandwich um of having teenage children and aging parents and my stepdad is my last living parent um but it's you know it's it's a it's a painful time that really stretches you in all these different directions and so in the midst of like leaving you know leaving my son um up at college and just coming back and being in the house and having it feel so strange that his room is empty and <laughs> you know he's not going to come bounding through the door later my my son is a big he's just a big personality he's a lot of energy he's funny he's affectionate he's you don't miss him when he comes into a room so it's it's a big shift in in energy in the house um and just getting used to that and you know feeling you know feeling sadness and obviously I miss him like so much but we're texting and we FaceTimed once already and like he's doing well and I think that was a real relief to me and something I want to say to any of you who have not kind of crossed this threshold yet that I realized when we got back on Sunday night um he had already gone and you know gone to Trader Joe's with his roommates and was going to an event you know like he's he was already out and doing things and and I just felt so relieved and I realized that as long as he's okay I'm okay you know as long as he's doing well he's feeling you know he's feeling all right not that he has to feel good every minute (laughs) it's a transition for him obviously as well and transitions are never like comfortable every minute you know they're probably going to be good days and tough days and all of that but as long as he is overall he's doing well and he's feeling good and he's 
getting out there and doing the things, I'm fine. Like I'm okay. I can handle grief. I've been, that's what I've been, so much of what I've been doing the last few years is grieving. I've lost both of my parents and, you know, all of that. So I, I, the grief doesn't, I'm not, I can, I can handle my own sadness or my own longing or my own pining for, you know, a time that's pat, like I can handle that. As long as he's okay, I'm okay. So that was really good for me to feel in my body and understand. And I think my daughter's feeling that same thing and leaving him in a place that's so beautiful. Like it's, he's in a beautiful, Northern California is so beautiful. Um, so all of those things help a lot. In the midst of all these things that are going on, there's also like the bigger, you know, the world that we're living in right now here in the United States. And I know some people who tune in are in other places in the world and, I'm so thrilled that you, you know, you like to listen um, and are part of this community. But for those of us who are here in the United States, obviously we're in the middle of this just incredibly exhausting (laughs) election cycle. And, you know, even though we have a shorter election than we have in previous years, it's like every day feels like 12 weeks. It's just (laughs) so long and there's just so much stuff that's going on that is I mean it just it breaks your heart it's it's exhausting um and it doesn't stop it doesn't stop for anything it doesn't stop when you take your kid to school it doesn't stop when you go to bury your mother's ashes like it doesn't you know it doesn't stop and I know if you've been following along you've been reading the things I've been writing or even listening to the podcast you know how I feel already for me this isn't even about like you know, political parties. It, it really isn't. Um, it's about women and girls in our country being endangered, you know, because of abortion bans, um, because certain life-saving medications that doctors have used to stop bleeding if a woman is hemorrhaging after childbirth, like those are now there's an effort to make these controlled substances that's happening in Louisiana, um, which means they won't be allowed on the birth card anymore, which means if some, you know, woman starts to crash, there's now a doctor, they're, they're training doctors to run to the, to, you know, the, the closet, the locked area where controlled substances are kept. They're timing them. I mean, these are life-saving medications that any... OBGYN would tell you they use almost every day and and that is so deeply upsetting to me for so many reasons and ultimately you know it's not it's like I will believe forever that we all deserve to have bodily autonomy and whatever your feelings might be about abortion these bans are not just affecting women who are electing to have abortions they're also having an unbelievably life-threatening and in some cases life-taking um the repercussions for women who you know wanted to have babies and are now having a pregnancy related emergency a fetal fatal abnormality a miscarriage um their lives are now endangered because the doctors in the states with the most restrictive abortion bounds are afraid to intervene until the mother's life is so at risk, no one could deny that. But the way the laws are written, and I know I've talked about this a lot, but I just want to make sure everybody's understanding why I'm so beside myself. The way these laws are written in some of the states with the most restrictive abortion bans, they're so unclear. They don't define what that means for the mother's life to be at risk. They don't, you know, is it like, do all of her organs have to be failing? Does her blood pressure have to be dropping to a certain level? Like, what does that look like? When is a doctor legally protected to intervene? Because in some of these states, a doctor can go to jail. Um, You know, it's, they can lose their medical license, they can go to jail. So, you know, it's not reasonable (laughs) to expect a doctor who spent eight years learning how to save lives, risk everything. And a lot of these, a lot of cases, these doctors are paying back these massive loans they've had to take out to go to medical school. It's not 
reasonable or okay to put doctors in this position either, you know, or hospitals. It's like none of this should be happening. It just, it didn't need to happen. It should not be happening and it wouldn't be happening. You know, lawmakers, legislators do not know more than doctors about what a woman needs or what a woman and her family need to do. It's not, it's not the government's role to be in your bedroom or in your deeply personal decisions about things that happen. And there's just been so much, you know, I mean, misinformation about like late term abortion, like people are not electing to have abortions in the seventh, eighth and ninth month of a healthy baby. That is not happening. You know, sometimes there are emergencies, there are things that come to light, the baby's not okay. Um, all, I mean, absolutely heartbreaking things happen. That's what a late-term abortion is about. It's something has gone desperately, dreadfully wrong. It's heart-wrenching for women who go through this. And either, you know, the mother's life is at stake or the baby isn't going to make it. So it's like, you know, that that's... When you have states that are not restricting abortion, it's not because they're going to, you know, women are going to suddenly come in and decide in the eighth month, oh, I don't feel it. That's not what it is. It's that those states are saying, this should not be in our purview. Like, we should not be weighing in on this. So there are no restrictions. That's between a woman and her doctor. That's why. And no one is, you know, there's no such thing as an abortion after birth. So there's just, at all, that's not a thing that happens and it is outrageous that it was ever you know that it ever became part of the public discourse but there are so many things that have become part of the public discourse that are just dreadfully upsetting and awful and that's really where I'm coming from now is just I I cannot in the midst of like all of these things that we're all dealing with you know in my life my my firstborn just went to college in your life other things are happening everybody's got their pressures and their stresses and the people they're grieving and the things that aren't going the way that they they thought that they would losses that they're grappling with or loneliness that they're feeling financial pressure like everybody's got stuff and in the midst of whatever's happening in your life to also have this onslaught this relentless just onslaught of things that really all of us should be able to agree this is just not this is not acceptable you know this isn't okay and I'm talking about people like Mark Robinson who is you know running for governor in North Carolina and is endorsed by the man running for president okay the man running for president again um, is endorsing this guy and he no one, like, we shouldn't be subjected to ever hearing anything out of this person's mouth again. You know, he should just be disqualified from running for any public office at all because he, all you have to do if you somehow are not, you know, aware of the story or what's been coming out, this is a man who claims to be a Christian and is incredibly anti-trans um, has said that abortions happen in this country because women are irresponsible and can't keep their skirts down. Uh, he is a black man and he wants to, he would be fine bringing slavery back. Like this is not, this is just something all of us should be able to say, oh, absolutely not my friend, go away. Like you need, you know, you need some help you're not mentally well, you certainly are not fit to hold public office, but that isn't what happens. This man says all these things, all these things come to light, all these different sites he's been on, and no one denounces this man. And not only is he not denounced, but the man running for president continues to endorse him. And that is unacceptable by anyone's standards. It really ought to be. Like, we shouldn't have to litigate this or talk about it. Like, it just should be an obvious, oh, okay, that is so far over the line of what we want in this country on any level in our leaders. He is disqualified, you know, the end. Um, 
but that doesn't happen because it's become some kind of weird game about winning. No one wins if that sort of human being takes office and holds power in a state as important as North Carolina. That's not a win for anyone, anyone, anywhere. That is a giant loss. That is a I don't even know what to call that. You know, that is a devastating blow for democracy if we can't say to ourselves, yep, nope, you need to just go away. Um, I'm going to talk about some other people. I, You know, we have a woman who is now flying around with the man running to be president of the United States again, and she is a white nationalist, a known white nationalist. This is not, you know... <laughs> It's right there. She is um, horribly racist. She tweeted just an absolutely offensive, offensive statement about, I, I mean, I don't even want to like repeat it, but you can Google, I hate to even say her name, Laura Loomer, you know, and she just had, I mean, literally like two weeks ago, tweeted something awful about, you know, what would happen if Kamala Harris wins and Curry in the White House. And like, I mean, it's the most racist, horrifying, disgusting, low level. No one should, this is again, unacceptable. She also in 2023 said she thought 9-11 was an inside job and the man running to be president again brought her to the 9-11 memorial. I mean, I am from New York City. Like, I was born there. I grew up there. I was there on 9-11. I don't know how to find the words to say just, just how deeply offensive that is. How horribly, disgustingly offensive that is to all the, like, first responders, all the people who lost their lives, everyone, the heartbreak that the trauma, the devastation that people went, you know, to have someone come and say that that is just not acceptable. And then to have a person running for the highest office in the land, bring that person around with him and bring her to the 9-11 memorial. Again, these are just things that should automatically be like, that's disqualifying. Like if that's your level of judgment, this is the kind of person you want to be spending your time with you should not be holding public office of any kind anywhere. Um, But, you know, that's not what's happening because it has turned into this game of, like, who's going to win and who's going to hold the power. And then there's a war on women. And there's a war on every marginalized group in our country right now. But, I mean, they are going after women like it's a job. (laughs) You know, like their job is to just, like, say the most offensive thing they can possibly say about women. Um... Haitian immigrants, legal Haitian immigrants, like they're just wreaking havoc wherever they can. And I don't know what to say about who is supporting this anymore. Like, I don't, this is not about me, you know, telling people your vote is sacred. You should be able to vote for anyone you want. This is about like, what is happening in this country that there's such a giant percentage of people who aren't saying absolutely not we're not doing that like where's the what has happened here I mean really have we lost the thread this much that we're gonna allow for this kind of speech and behavior and normalization of this kind of speech and behavior like is this really what we're doing we're gonna let women bleed out in parking lots we're going to have doctors be put in a situation where they don't intervene until it's too late. Um, We're going to decide that girls and women don't have equal access to the same life-saving health care any boy or man would have if he showed up at the ER and was bleeding out. We're going to, that's what we're going to do. We're going to have white nationalists running around with presidential candidates and people running for governor of states who are just despicable. This cannot be it. You know, and honestly, like if 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 I were a Republican at this point, you know, an old school Republican, 
who believed in small government. I can respect that. You know, I don't agree. That's not my philosophy, okay? My philosophy is I want to make sure everybody has what they need. And so that's what I think the purpose of the government is, to make sure everyone's got equal access to infrastructure, you know, roads, right, hospitals, like they schools, um, equal access to a good education, to clean water and air, you know, like – that for me is like no one should be living on the streets uh you know no one should be going hungry like to be lifting everyone up that's what i that's my flaw it does not have to be yours in the old days republicans were like i want small government i want the states to be managing their own citizens and making sure nobody's living on the streets and making sure everybody has what they have and all but that's not happening when you leave it to the states, what's going on now is a disaster for people who are living on the fringes. They're not being, there is no safety net. You know, everything has just kind of, I mean, it's, there's like our health insurance is broken. You know, we're, we're like big pharma and lobbyists have politicians in their pockets. And there's all kinds of, I mean, there's so many things that need to be fixed and addressed. So, if it were, if I were an old school Republican who believed in small government, I'd be talking to my party now and saying, like, listen, this is unacceptable. This we have some, we've gone off the rails here, and we need to get back on the like, you know, Liz Cheney, Mitt Romney bandwagon here, and and come up with a reasonable kind of ticket that reasonable people who are interested in, like small government and their finances whatever can get behind but this is not it this is horrifying that's what I I, honestly that's where I would be coming from at this point we could also be talking about like how we need a third this two-party system isn't serving us but right now the situation that we're in we're like it's go time you know we gotta get it together here in a very very short amount of time because these people they're not it and I'm sorry like I really am I know that there are people who've been voting Republican their whole lives I have family members like that you know extended family members like I understand what that is and I'm sorry because it must be really upsetting that your party has been turned into something no one from like if you know if someone had been frozen a republican had been frozen for 30 years you know whatever and they were thought out and they looked at what was they'd be like what is happening this is insanity um that's i think the energy that you know i would be that's where i would be at because this party that's in front of us and the things these people are doing i really honestly just feel this is kindergarten stuff, right? This is stuff we learned in the sandbox. This is not how we treat people. This is not what we do. This is not how we speak. This is not how we treat our neighbors. This is just not it. Um, and so, you know, I want to write an essay this week about dropping my son off at college, but I can't help but remember, like, Amber Thurman will not get to do that because she isn't here anymore. And her six-year-old son has to grieve the loss of his mother and, and never get to have that experience, you know? Not have his mom there when he moves into the college dorm, when he, you know, whatever, if he gets married. One day, like, she's, she's gone to him. She's lost to him. And she did not need to be. Um, you know, I just, there are so many things that I want to be writing about and talking about grief and losing people and you know just like all the things that have been such a big part of my life the last few years because we all we, we're all going to go through that you know we're all going to go through most of the same things as human beings we really are and I just I guess I just so deeply wish that we could connect again you know, that we could find some common ground here. I understand if you're like, I, you know, I don't want to vote for a Democrat. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I get it. <laughs> but, like, these are the two options that you have in front of you. And there's really only one. There's just one option now. Because this other situation that's going on is, like, 
my kids knew better than this at five, you know, they knew at five years old, this is not, this is not what we do. And you, you all know, we all know this. We do, we know in our hearts, this is not okay. Um, so yeah, you know, I, 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 um, it's really just come down to like human beings on a planet together and me just like hoping that we can that we can agree that you know this is just not this is just not gonna this is not it and we need to be doing a lot better than this whole mess of people saying horrific and horrible things like the news should not be it shouldn't create PTSD for you you know like you shouldn't read the news and just be speechless because you can't believe what people are saying or what's happening that just shouldn't be happening that's not normal we don't have to live like this let alone the school shootings and my friend I have a very close friend of mine um he lives in Portland Oregon and he (laughs) he got shot at I mean he got shot at with a nine millimeter like it, it was shot into his sunroof for sport but it was like a couple of feet from his head and that was just two weeks ago like this is not it folks you know we we just need to like we need to pull ourselves together and have a reboot we just need to have a reboot and if it means you have to vote for someone and you know you got to do it sucking on a lemon like that's I'm sorry you know but like let's let's just let's just get together again and try to try to fix things let's at least have some hope of fixing things you can't fix things with people who um want to take over and you know make it so you're you're not voting anymore like let's try to hold on to this country and just start over start again start where we are do better we can do it Uh, but we can't do it with people who are you know flying around with white nationalists that's not going to do it so um there's my (laughs) there's my talk for the week I am sending you love I really I am if you are someone that finds this just deeply like I'm sorry if this is your party and this is what has happened to it but yeah let's please try to just um Let's try to come back and remember we are neighbors and we can we we don't have to do this. This is not how things have to be and it's not how they should be. This is exhausting. Let's go back to like having lives where we can enjoy our people and you know um, not not be inundated with yeah with offensive insanity day after day. This is just too much, right? All right, I'm sending you lots of love and I hope that you're safe out there and healthy and. I'm looking forward to better days ahead for all of us. Till next time.